Well, good evening, folks. Uh, it's lovely to see you all gathering with us this evening once again for our midweek meeting. We trust that God will bless us as we come to uh, spend a bit of time in his word tonight and then before the throne of grace in prayer. Uh, it's been a bit of a, a bit of a mixed day as far as the weather's concerned, uh, but uh, I trust that you're nice and warm at home and comfortable and ready to spend a little time learning from the Lord tonight. Let us come before him just now to bless our time together, to speak to our hearts and uh, that we might glorify him tonight in all that we say and do. Let's just come before him in prayer. Blessed God and loving eternal heavenly Father, we thank thee again, Lord, for the good blessings that we've enjoyed today, for your good hand upon us. Lord, uh, regardless of what the weather's like outside, our God is unchanging and he's faithful. Father, we thank you that you are that immutable God, the eternal one, the one who holds all things in his hands. And Father, we pray that as we have come before thee this evening, that you would be pleased to bless us as we come to thy word. We pray, Lord, that your word would speak to our hearts, that it would be an encouragement to us. And we pray, Father, that we would be rejoicing because of the relationship that we now have with thee. Lord, we thank you that we have the Holy Spirit who's able to teach us all things and more than able, he's willing to teach us all things. We pray, Lord, that we might hear from him this evening. And then as we go to prayer a little later, we ask, Lord, that you would be pleased not only to hear, but to answer our prayers. Father, we will be interceding for those who need our prayers. Some, Lord, who can't pray for themselves because they're not yet saved. But Lord, we thank you that we have this privilege of interceding on their behalf, that you would speak to their hearts and save their souls. Others, Lord, going through difficult times and they need our prayers to bear them up before thee so that they might find strength and grace to be their portion. So, Lord, we pray that we would pray fervently tonight. We pray that we would pray in the way we would hope others would pray for us if we were in similar circumstances. We pray, Lord, that that would inspire us and motivate us to come before thee willingly and with boldness tonight. And, Father, that we would be pleased to see great things following. So, Lord, bless her gathering together online this evening. We pray, Lord, that your hand would be upon us, that you would bless others, Lord, that are serving thee elsewhere, that they too would know thy help. We think especially for Brother David and uh, the CWU this evening and Mark Felt. And, Lord, we pray that he would know great liberty from thyself as he would minister the word of God with them. But, Lord, we pray that each of us would know thy presence and thy help in all that we say and do, for we ask it in our Saviour's name. Amen. Amen. Well, folks, before we go any further, let's just sing uh, before the Lord. We're going to be looking at Psalm 23. We're going to begin looking at it this evening and over the next, I think, couple of weeks anyway. Uh, we're looking at seven promises from the Shepherd's Psalm. Seven promises from the Shepherd's Psalm we're looking at. And we're going to just sing that psalm this evening uh, in this version that we know quite well now by Stuart Townend of Psalm 23. Let's uh, really enjoy singing this together. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores. My soul, and I will trust in you alone, and I will trust in you alone for your endless mercy follows me, your goodness will lead me. my ways in righteousness and he anoints my head with oil and my cup it overflows with joy I feast on his pure delights and I will trust in you 
still think that's a, a beautiful version of that song and uh, I trust that we enjoyed singing it together this evening. Well let's turn to Psalm 23 then tonight and read it together. I know that we know it well but it's always good to have the word of God in front of us and let's uh, read Psalm 23. We're told that it's a psalm of David uh, along with many of these psalms especially in the early part of the book and uh, it's David of course knows a lot about being a shepherd and uh, he takes that and he applies it as if he was the sheep. And we see that right from the very beginning. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. I trust God will bless his word to your hearts this evening. I know that many people have spoken on Psalm 23, and I've spoken on Psalm 23 before as well. Uh, I know that it's been five years since I have, but I haven't looked at any previous notes or anything like that. And uh, it's always good to come back to a, a fresh passage, someone that we're familiar with, but approach it maybe in a fresh way. And as we go through this um, over this week and God willing, the next couple of weeks, I just want us to see some of the promises that we see in this. Um, and I'm going to begin straight away just with verse one. We see the shepherd's preservation. The shepherd's preservation. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And it speaks into the character of the shepherd. This is a shepherd that cares for his sheep and gives attention to his sheep. The shepherd knows what the sheep need before the sheep are even aware that they need it. And God's care for us is complete care. He already has put in place all of the resources that we will ever need. And he knows when we'll need to call upon them and he knows where we'll need to call upon them. And he's already put them out for us. His care for us is complete. And this is a thought that comes through again in the New Testament when the Lord was speaking in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 30. He says, wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Notice that he says, take no thought that we're not to be concerned about where we're going to get our food, our drink, our clothing from, because the Lord knows that we have need of these things. And because the Lord cares for us, then he will give us what we need. 
and, and his care is implied when it says, for your heavenly father knows. When the Lord said that, for your heavenly father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. That it, It's taken for granted. It's, it, it's almost assumed, but it's a safe assumption that our heavenly father not only knows, but he cares. And because he knows and cares, he will provide all that we need. Now, through our own carelessness or through pride or some other sinful reason, it's possible for us to miss out on our Father's care. The care that he desires to give us, he may withhold because of our foolishness. In Proverbs 19 and verse 15, we read, Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. And so it is possible, even for the child of God, to miss out on God's care through carelessness, through foolishness, through idleness. But Christ gave us the conditions in that same Sermon on the Mount under which we can expect to be provided for. Because the following verse from where we stopped, we stopped at verse 32, but verse 33 is very well known to us. Where the Lord continues he started by saying, for your heavenly father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. And then he says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. All what things? The food, the clothing, the things that we need to drink. They will all be added unto us. Those daily provisions, that daily bread that we need. It will be provided to us if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The Lord's actually referring to another psalm when he says this. If you were to turn for a moment into Psalm 34 and verse 10. Psalm 34 and verse 10, and we see a very strong similarity between this and what the Lord Jesus said in Matthew 6:33. Psalm 34 and verse 10, the young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. See the second part of that verse, they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing, shall not be in want of any good thing. That's the idea there. In the previous verse, it says, oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. And that comes immediately after another verse that we're so familiar with, which says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. So he talks about trusting in the Lord and fearing the Lord and seeking the Lord, and that those who do that won't be in want of anything that they need. Young lions, uh, we read about in verse 10 of Psalm 34. Young lions are strong, they're enthusiastic, but they can also be prone to roaring. They like roaring and uh, making a noise. They're filled with pride, and the pun is intended there. But that's that pride that can cause them to go hungry. They strut around as the king of the beasts, and while they roar, their prey runs away, and the lions can go hungry. But those who seek the Lord don't show any of that pride. They're more like sheep who know the voice of their shepherd, and they trust that voice. The Lord, remember, said in John 10, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. We follow that voice because we understand that the shepherd cares for us. As long as the sheep keep following the shepherd's voice, they know that they're going to be provided for. They're going to be provided with everything that they need. Why? Because the shepherd cares for his sheep. And so the Lord repeats that teaching during this Sermon on the Mount. And so he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. When the Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want but we need to recognize him as the shepherd. We need to treat him as the shepherd. We need to follow him as the shepherd. And when we do that, then we will be provided with all that we need. So long as we're prioritizing the Lord, his work and his word, all the things we need, he'll provide. 
if our priorities are right, if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, we'll work hard. We'll care for our families. We'll honor the powers that be. And we're not going to bring hardship upon ourselves because of our own foolishness and our own wickedness. But hardness may come. Hardship may still come, not because of our wickedness, but because of circumstances that the Lord has allowed. But when those hardships come, because we have been faithful to the Lord, because we've been faithfully following his voice, the Lord promises to care for us. There are those of you who are going through hard times at the moment. Some that, uh, that those hard times are physical. It's an illness, perhaps. For others, the hard time is the loss of a loved one, and we want to continue to remember our sister Arlene at the moment and the loss that she feels. For others, it may be emotional, it may be mental, it may be spiritual, those hardships. But folks, if we keep following the Lord, the Lord will care for us. The Lord will provide all that we need. Now, I'm not talking about salvation. You see, whether or not we remain saved isn't in our hands, it's in God's hands. And he has promised that nothing can take us out of his hands. So our salvation is certain, it's secure. As we were thinking on uh, Sunday evening, it's, we have a no so salvation. But for our daily needs, God's promised provision can depend on our faithfulness. Now, some may say, say well, that's Old Testament teaching. We aren't under the law. We're under grace. So how can you say that we have to be faithful to be sure of God's provision and care? Well, because it's also a New Testament principle, turn over into the New Testament to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, sorry, chapter 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we see the same principle put forward in different words. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6. And Paul writes, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Now, we often apply this to the fruit of our labor for the Lord and seeing the fruit of that labor, seeing souls saved or people growing in faith or, or some kind of spiritual response. But this verse says that ye always having all sufficiency in all things. Now, I take God at his word. When God says in his word, all sufficiency for all things, I think God means all sufficiency for all things, not just the spiritual, but also the physical. And so our God, because he cares for us, he wants to provide our sufficiency in everything, the spiritual, the emotional, the mental, the physical, in every part of our lives. He wants to make sure that we have sufficient in all things. It doesn't mean necessarily we're going to have all that we desire. We know that truth. I'm not going to labor that point. But we know that we will have everything that we need. All sufficiency. To have sufficient is to have what we need. And God often gives us far, far more than what we need. Many of us have far more than what we need for daily life. And God has given so much to us. Sometimes the Satan might have made sure that we got an awful lot because he knows that it can be a temptation to pull us away from Christ. That comfort and that materialistic attitude can pull us away from the Lord. But other times the Lord does give us so much and we have to thank God for the good things in our life. Those good things that we enjoy that, that don't take us away from him, but allow us to to enjoy the things we have it more comfortably, they're not always a bad thing. We ought always to be thankful for them because there's so many in the world don't have a fraction of what we have. So we shouldn't take them for granted. But we can thank God for them. 
but he, is, he hasn't promised to give us all those things. He has promised to give us all sufficiency. The Lord himself taught this as well. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 37, sorry, 38, he says, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over. Shall men give into your bosom? For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. It's the same principle of sowing and reaping. But again, it's talking about things that are physical, that are material. I, there's some, sometimes you go to, uh, to get an ice cream over the summer. And uh, whenever they're getting ice cream, say it's one of those scoop ones, they just put a scoop and put it on the top and it's just balancing on the top of the cone. And I'm not so keen on those ones. But you get others, and whenever they get the scoop of ice cream and they put it on, then they get another bit and they cram it onto the top and they, they get maybe three or four scoops and they cram it all together until you've got this great big mass, massive pile of ice cream on the top of the cone. And it's not just balanced, they're stuck to it and overflowing it. That's the kind of picture that we have here. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, running over. The Lord will give what we put in, but he will give so much more as well. You know why so many people don't get a lot out of church and out of the Christian life? Because they don't put very little into it. And the principle of reaping what we sow comes into play. The Lord is our shepherd. We shall not want. And when we recognize him as our shepherd, when we come before him, when we follow him, he has promised that when our eyes are fixed on the shepherd, well, his care will be fully realized in us. The shepherd's preservation. But secondly, I want you to see the shepherd's peace. The shepherd's peace. Verse two, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Now, when I have thought of this verse before, I focused on the sheep lying down in green pastures. The sheep lying down in the green pastures. But I was reading it again today, and something else came into my mind. Where did the green pastures come from? Are the pastures not prepared beforehand by the shepherd in preparation for moving his sheep into them? Does he not prepare the ground and sow the seed and scare away the birds that would eat the seed? Does he not make sure the ground is well irrigated so that the grass will grow? You see, the Lord makes a difference between the shepherd and an hireling. This isn't someone who is hired to look after the sheep. This is someone whose life is about caring for the sheep. And he, as the shepherd, has prepared the green pastures for the sheep to go into. He has prepared that peaceful place. And a lot of work goes into preparing that peaceful place. But none of that work is done by the sheep. In Ephesians 2, verse 15, we read, Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. The work that Christ has put into our green pastures, our place of peace, cost him his earthly life. It was in his flesh that he paid the price of our sin. It was by the giving of his blood and the shedding of his blood that he purchased redemption for us. Paul repeats this truth to the church in Colossae. He says in Colossians 1.21, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. That's a picture of the peace that we have with God. We are now holy, unblameable, unreprovable. We're not as holy or as unblameable or as unreprovable as we hope to be, but one day we will be. And as far as God looking upon us now is concerned, this is our standing. And one day we will be presented before the Father, holy, unblameable, unreprovable, and that ought to give us great peace. In Hebrews, this thought's taken further. It's not only describing how the peace was purchased, but what kind of peace it is. In Hebrews 10, verse 19, 
having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God. Now, that's, that's all about how our peace was purchased by the blood of Jesus, and that is to say, his flesh, the price of our peace. And then the type of peace, verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. There are three things in that that, we, that show us that we have peace. We have peace because we have assurance. The writer to the Hebrew says, in full assurance of faith. Or again, as we we're thinking on Sunday, and no so salvation. I know that I'm saved. I'm assured of that salvation because of the promises of God and the, the character of God and the character of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he accomplished. Because he is the one who has purchased my salvation, because he is the one who has saved me, he is the one that will keep me. He is the one that will bring me to heaven. I have full assurance of faith because of what Christ has done for me. And because of that assurance, I can have peace. And so can you. But then there's also justification. We have peace because we have justification. He goes on and says, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. In this phrase, I'm reminded of Romans 8, 33, where it says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Because we are justified, there is no charge can be brought against us. Now, the tense used here is the perfect tense. It's something that's happened in the past. It's already happened to us. But the consequences and the events as a result of it are lasting to the present and beyond. Something that's, that's happened in the past, but we're living with the benefits of it still today. We have been justified in the sight of God. And so when we now, as God's children, confess our sin, our Father in heaven is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The work of justification upon us at the moment of salvation gives us peace upon our ongoing confession of and repentance from daily sins today. And we have peace because we are justified in the sight of a holy God. So we, we have peace because we're assured, we have assurance, we have peace because we've been justified, we have peace because we've been sanctified. Paul concludes that verse by saying, our bodies washed with pure water. Now, the fact that it's our bodies being washed is evidence that this is a present work that's ongoing. You know that we a song that says, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. So because of Christ purchasing salvation through his flesh, we can lie down in green pastures that were made green by the labor that he has put into them. It's his labor that has produced those green pastures of peace, those assurances, those, the knowledge of our justification, the pasture of sanctification. These are green pastures to us. They are peaceful places. They are places where we can put our rest in. They're places where we can find rest. And every day we can go to one of these green pastures. We can go to the pasture of assurance, to the green pasture of justification, the green pasture of sanctification. And every time we go into those green pastures, we'll find peace, we'll find rest. But we're also led by still waters. Water often speaks of the scriptures, and especially when that water is drinking water, as seems to be the case here. Is speaking of the scriptures, what are the qualities of this drinking water? Well, it says that it's still waters. And try to think of what those still waters would be like, that, the, that this good shepherd is leading us beside. Well, they're going to be quiet. The still waters are quiet waters. They're not jarring. They're not grating. They're not 
unsettling us in an evil sense. Even when we're being challenged by the scriptures, even when the scriptures are disturbing us, there is always hope and there's always that call to a closer fellowship with the Lord. And so even that disturbing the scriptures brings into our lives, it's got a, a positive and a good purpose to it. It's not the kind of unsettledness that sin brings. When sin brings unsettledness into us, there's, there's no hope in that sin. There's no comfort in that sin. There's no peacefulness or quietness about that sin. It unsettles us. It disturbs us. And we're never right until we get back to the scriptural, the scriptural passages that prove to us that we're to come confessing and repenting. And whenever we do what the scriptures say, then the peace returns, the quietness returns. I've stood by the Niagara Falls. I've listened to the roar of the waters crashing over the edge into the rocks below. I've been on the Maid of the Mist at the base of the falls as the force of that water falling down covers everything with its spray. And it's impressive to see it and to hear it, but it's not going to put you at rest. You don't want to go anywhere near it. Whenever you see it at the top of the falls, the sheer volume of water going over the side is very, very impressive. It's impressive, but it's impressive in its ferocity and in its danger. The scriptures aren't like that. It's a place that invites us to draw near. The scriptures are a place that impress us with its serenity. Impress us with its ability to soothe our troubled souls. These still waters are quiet. But these still waters are safe. Because who's leading us beside them? See, you can have two kinds of still waters. You can have the safe ones or you can have the dangerous ones. You can have the dangerous ones where the water looks nice and calm, but it just drops off at the edge and it's very, very deep and there's weeds at the bottom that you can get tangled in and drown. Or you can have the still waters that where the, the, the bank goes into them very gently and it's easy to go into them and it's safe to go in. The shepherd is leading us beside these waters. And he knows that we're going to be drawn to them to drink because of their stillness. But because he cares for us and because he won't put us in danger, we know that these waters are safe. And so we know that the word of God is safe. It challenges, it, it, it's challenging to change us. But these waters are safe. No one ever ended up destroyed by following God's word. No one who sought to live according to its teachings and its precepts has ever become shipwrecked in life. Rather, they've gained assurance and boldness. They've obtained peace and joy. When circumstances have been chaotic, God's word has been that oasis of calm that they've needed. The scriptures aren't always easy. Peter admitted that many of Paul's writings are difficult to understand, but all scripture is profitable if it's properly understood and applied. And so these waters are quiet, they're safe, and they're refreshing. Why does the shepherd lead beside the waters in the first place? It's so that the sheep can be, drink and be refreshed. Notice that the shepherd is leading beside the waters. It was very foolish of us to come to the word of God just haphazard without any kind of system without any kind of plan and just open at random it's very rare that there's going to be a blessing in that we're to be led by the spirit of god the god wants to lead us through the scriptures that's why it's good often whenever we're preaching to have a plan of preaching a, a plan of uh, what topic or what book or what character we're going to be studying that's why I'm relieved that I've got a plan for the next couple of weeks as well in Psalm 23. But it's so the Lord can lead us for refreshment through his word. You know that song says, how sweet the living water from the hills of God. It makes me glad and happy all the way. My glory, grace and blessing mark the path I've trod. I'm shouting hallelujah every day. 
drinking at the springs of living water. Happy now am I, my soul they satisfy, drinking at the springs of living water. Oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. Folks, God has been so kind to us. He's been so caring to us that he's brought us into his green pastures where we can find peace and beside his still waters where we can find refreshing. We, that's how he gives us peace in life. He has preserved us through his care in providing us with all that we ever need. In good times and bad times, God is always there. His provision is consistent. And it's never failing. We often fail him. And at those times, we may miss out on the blessing he would want to give us. And folks, whenever we're following our shepherd, we will never want. He will lead us into the green pastures. He will lead us beside still waters. And God willing, over the next week or two, we'll see more of the great promises from this shepherd's psalm. Amen. We trust God will bless his word to all of our hearts this evening. Well, folks, we're going to go straight to prayer tonight.